Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to Truth. It is a blessing and a privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week that wasn't promised that God has smiled on you and that this message finds you healthy and finds you blessed and finds you challenged in life, though, but growing. You know, I'm always excited when it comes back time to get in the word and to share with his children. And this is the thing. The message today is really, um, I had this conversation, I think, with my bride probably a couple weeks ago about why Jesus. Why would I choose Jesus? Out of all the smorgasbords of faith that you could choose in this life right now, why Jesus? And so as I continue, I articulated some of my thoughts with her on that deal, but as I continued to think about it more and more, because I was doing something and God was preaching this message to me in my head as to why Jesus, you know, you know, Jesus has never called me out of my name. He knows everything about me. I'm trying to tell you why Jesus. He's never called me out of my name. He knows everything about me. And yet, even though he knows everything about me, yet he still loved me beyond my faults. Come on, now I'm trying to help you understand, because see, you got to realize why Jesus, and and, um, and he shows me his love. And he tells me I'm valuable, but then he doesn't just tell me I'm valuable. He shows me that I am valuable. He says, I'm going to show you how valuable you are to me, that to save you, I'm going to give my son up for you. So I'm just trying to hit because see, when you ask, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this question. Why Jesus? Why Christianity? Why this? You know, right? I've been asked this question a bunch. And I've had good answers at this time, but this last revelation that he's been giving me, it was, took me deeper because he, he's taking all the things that the world has used against me, and he says, I've never used any of those things against you. And I know all about you. Come on now. You see, so, and therefore, when you wonder why I would call him Abba, why I would call him Father, and why I would be honored to be his child, it's the love that he has lavished. It's the love that he has given. It's the love that he has blessed and poured into. That would be the church. Amen. And that has been the key. Hallelujah. Too often we forget about the love. We talk about it, but we don't live it. And so my greatest challenge in all of this, because everything in the world today can claim the church. Well, I did it in Jesus' name, or I claim this, or I claim that, right? He's very clear about what it looks like to be his child and what it looks like to be the church. It's very, very clear. And when he lavishes his love on you, it's because there is a transformed life on the other side of that lavishment. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know that word lavish is a word word? See, it's better than luxury. Lavishing means that it's an overabundance, just overflowing, just running all over the place and he don't care. Isn't that a powerful statement? Because see, luxury means you have something and it's of a value of certain and it's only to that extent. Lavishing it means it just runs over. Are y'all getting me? Amen. So now I shared this with you because we're going to look at his love this morning. Y'all with me? Y'all kind of quiet, man. Y'all kind of quiet. I'm going to pray for y'all today, okay? So, so if you t turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, starting at the first verse, say amen when you have to say amen. You got it? Okay. All right. If you have it, say amen. If not, say what on me. 1 John chapter 3, starting at the first verse, it reads this way. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that, have, that we should be called the children of God. And there's an exclamation point in my version. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Verse two, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant. Come and humble before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be you and your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hour has come where your people have gathered themselves together once again to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power to fill me afresh anew with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before us. 
And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer and will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? Amen. And amen. This morning's sermon title is called The Real Church in the Father's Love. The Real Church in the Father's Love. And I had to title it that way because a lot of people are claiming church. I, you can claim to be a chair, and I have to acknowledge that in this day and time that you're a chair, even though I see you as a person. But see, I, I'm saying this, the, the issue is that I'm saying the real church because there is anything can be a church. You can call it what you want. But see, in the Bible, he speaks of the real church, and he gives the qualification of what the real church looks like. And when we talk about the lavishing of his love, it is always up on the real church. It's never on the fake. Okay. And so at the top of your outline, you will find a word, love. And then in parentheses, you'll see the Greek word, agape, right beside it. Because I have to explain it to you because, see, we use the word love in the English language for everything from tacos to toenails. Right? So I want you to understand which love that we're focusing on this morning. We're talking about the love, a Greek word for selfless love, the type of love which characterizes God. Agape is primary an act of the will rather than the emotions. Amen. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning. I found this song. It's called The Love of God. Right. I've listened to it many times, but for whatever reason this past week, I've had to I, I, it got so good to me that I had to go and get the words to it. And it's on the back of your outline this morning, the words to this song. So I want you to take a moment, read over while I speak. But I got to share with you, I found this song with the lyrics telling about the love of God. And I believe they are among the most beautiful and poetic descript, describing God's love. You know? And so this song gave me great images in my mind of how vast and great God's love is. Because, see, I know to what degree of the pit of hell I should be in. But yet his love reached down and pulled me out. You see, I understand that now. But the song is starting to help those images. I'm a person of pictures anyhow in my mind, right? And so as I'm reading through that and as I'm listening to the song and I'm, I'm just thinking about where my life started at and where it is now and at every peak and valley and every low place, he was there. So, wow. Because here's the thing. The most amazing, the most important, the most life-changing concept contained in the Bible is the declaration of God's love for human beings. Somebody need to say something. Do you know that is the most amazing statement and declaration in the entire word of God is his declaration for his love for human beings. John 3 16 he says for God so loved the world. I think most about everybody knows that even if you're atheist or not I think you know that passage of scripture right? And every act of God on man's behalf flows from that basic concept. Do y'all get it? For God so loved the world that every basic act after that on man's behalf flows from that basic concept. Period. Wrong or right. God so loved the world. Do you see how deep that is? You see, you would think that remembering God's love for us that believe would be easy. Perhaps in a way it is easy to remember in some intellectual sense, right? But it is quite often forgotten, neglected, ignored, and even rejected. You see what I love about the book of 1 John? In the book of 1 John, there is a constant listing of things about which John wanted to remind his readers of. So they were things that would bring us back to the foundation of the truth of, the, of our faith. There are things that would warn us to ignore the lies of false and faulty philosophies, right? And they were things that are intended to secure us in the truth about who Jesus is. And that is what's so powerful. He's writing this list of things, reminding us of all this in God. And he's keeping us saying, this is who you have and this is what you have and this is what you're going to be. He's telling you all of these things. But then I get to chapter three. And when I get to chapter three, it says, how great is the love of the Father has lavished on us. 
So here's the thing. It should not be a surprise that John now wants to get our attention by reminding us of God's love. Everything God does for us comes out of his love. Amen. Amen. Everything. Even correction comes out of his love. See, he calls it chastisement (laughs) and not punishment. Mm -hmm. Chastisement is done in the essence of love. Mm -hmm. Punishment is done with the absence of love. Y'all realize that, right? And so... I get excited when I realize that everything the father does, it is always from his love. And so it's in verse 1a, John tells us how great this love is. He says, how great is the love that the father has lavished on us? And that word lavished, okay, we were at the racetrack yesterday, and um, they had this new little booth that sold coffee and uh, biscuits and gravy. What a combination, right? We're in the afternoon. It's two or three in the afternoon, right? And all of a sudden, there's Dion and Sean with coffee and Pete with biscuits and gravy. (laughs) And so when I look at the biscuits and gravy, the gravy ran all over it, all down the sides of it, right? That was lavished on it. They just didn't put a dollop and say, here. They lavished it over where they just take, like they didn't even care how much grease and, and flour and water they was using, all right? Just lavished it over it, right? And so this is what I'm talking about, that when he lavishes his love over you, it just runs all down onto the ground, and it should create a little puddle around you. That's how great it is. And he tells us how great is the Father's love has lavished on us. And so John stands in amazement this morning about God's love. The very thought of being born of God captures God's, John's mind with wonder. Can you imagine that, that it was love that saved us? It was love that reconciled us. It was love that has made us uh, sons and daughters unto him. It is love, right? And so he calls us to look and take a look at this and this wonderful love and that brought us into the family ourselves. He says, I want you to look at it. See, we've accepted it, but we've never examined it. For what it really is. For I'm reminded that this love was present even while we were yet sinners. The Apostle Paul shares in Romans chapter 5 verse 8, he says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. You might want to underline that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Somebody to say something, right? But it doesn't stop there. For John chapter 15 verse 13 says this. This is Jesus speaking. There is no greater love than to lay your life down for a friend, right? But here comes the question. What about an enemy? Mm-hmm. Isaiah 59 two says this. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Do y'all get the image? Mm-hmm. Our sins has created this great chasm between God and us. And it was in this great gap between God and man that his love was the greatest. Somebody needs to say something because what can cover the gap? The chasm is too wide, too deep. But what can cover it? His love. It wasn't a love based on feelings, but his will. Do you realize that when in John 3, 16, when it says, for God so loved the world, the world was God's enemy. There was nothing lovable in it or about it. And here comes his love. You see, Jesus is the proof of his love and the instrument for reconciliation of man back unto God. So I, too, stand in amazement of God's love because it doesn't fit into my mind or my head, but it fits perfectly in my heart. Somebody needs to say something. Because, see, in my mind, you try to figure it out, but in my heart, it just accepts it. And it's in verse 1b that John shares that we should be called children. He says that we should be called children of God with an exclamation point. He says, and that is what we are. And see, I'm talking about the real church and the father's love because, see, that's what he's speaking to, the real church. That's who you are as his children. 
Still in amazement of God's overflow, John saw in God's love that we should be called the children of God. See, you see, love could have saved us without making us children of God. Somebody needs to say some process that what I just said. Love could have saved us without making us children of God. Do you understand? See, I got that look on your face because you're not processing it right. Think about this. Love could have saved us without making us children of God. He could have just said, you're saved, and you're on your own. He adopted us. He brought us in. I want you to get this point because this is key. He could have just spoken and you've been good, but he brought you into the fold and made you his. Are y'all getting this? You see, the manner of God's love is shown in that he brought us into his family as children. That's the manner of God's love. We were hot messes. And he looked beyond those faults and saw enough of each of us that his grace would come up on us and we would accept it and call him father. Somebody needs to say something. And he doesn't bring the old past back up. He doesn't go, well, no, see, you acted up this week. I knew you weren't going to be anything because of what you used to be. He never does that. John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13 says this, Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And here's the thing. The message of adoption is right here. It is by nature that a man is the creation of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. But it is by grace that he becomes the child of God. Somebody to say something. The two different. It is by nature that a man is the creation of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is by grace that he becomes the child of God. So now, someone may want to protest or argue the point that by virtue of creation, that we are all the children of God. I've had this debate. Okay? I'm here to deal with it. There are two English words which are closely connected, both whose meanings are widely different. The first word is paternity. The second word is fatherhood. Paternity describes a relationship in which a man is responsible for the physical existence of a child. Amen? Amen. Fatherhood describes an intimate and loving relationship. In the sense of paternity, all men are the children of God. But in the sense of fatherhood, we are the children of God only when he makes his gracious approach to us and we respond in acceptance of him as Lord and Savior. Somebody needs to say something. That's how you become the child. See, I'm talking about the real church and the father's love this morning. God adopted us into his family. Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 says this, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of what? Underline this in your Bible. Spirit of adoption. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are, not will be, we are. That's a present past tense speaking of it. Isn't that beautiful? And because God has adopted us through Christ Jesus, we now share in his inheritance. For Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says it this way. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Somebody needs to say something. See, I'm talking about the real church and the father's love this morning. I'm going to break this adoption thing down to you real quick. Because adoption is a legal action. It's a legal action by which a person takes into his family a child who is not his own and has no rights within that family in order to give that child all the same privileges as his own children. Somebody needs to say something. I know about that. 
Feel some tears coming. The basic motivation behind an act like that is compassion or love. Because love gives. It gives. And so it is with God, who sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons and daughters. Somebody needs to say something. You see, for we are the king's children now, not later. We're the king's children now, and we should act and live as such. Somebody needs to say something. See, I'm talking about the real church and the Father's love this morning. And it's in verse 1c where John shares, the world does not know us. He says, for the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Right now, the world is struggling to see the real church because everything under the sun can claim church. But he said you would never know it by its title. He said you would know it by its love. Mm. Are y'all getting this? I hope your pens are working. See, I've been looking through the scriptures. At every interaction Jesus has had with someone that was not already Christian. And I don't see anywhere in there where he destroyed anybody. I don't even see in there where he was willing, wanting to deny them protection or rights. See, I'm just trying to help you understand. The illustration is in the word. You just got to go look for it. So if he walked amongst all the sins of the world because, as Solomon wrote, there's nothing new under the sun that's happening today that hadn't happened then, right? And if he walked amongst all those people, you don't find nowhere captured in Scripture where he's literally hoping to destroy or deny people protections or, or provisions or, 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 or even though they didn't believe in him. He wasn't trying to deny them food. He wasn't trying to deny them existence. He wasn't trying to deny them uh, just the simple protection as a citizen of whatever city that they lived in. I'm just trying to make it very plain because, see, when you, you look at the people around you that's claiming the church and they're doing things that don't look like the church. Amen. I need for you to see it. I need for you to call it out for what it is. He needs for you to call it out because, see, they don't know the church. Mm -hmm. Because we've hidden in the shades. Mm -hmm. We're neglecting who we are and what we are. I don't know what the fear is. Maybe it's the fear of losing friends. Maybe it's the fear of being unpopular. Maybe it's the fear of somebody giving you a mean tweet or a mean written something on your timeline. I don't know. But I got a greater reverence for God and what he called me to be than to worry about what somebody's going to write on me on a social media page. And so this is why I think he continues to give me words like this. Because... I'm sounding the alarm that the church needs to rise up and become all that he called us and saved us to be. And it doesn't look like a lot of the stuff that's happening in our world right now that's claiming church. Amen. And so. Amen. And so this is the thing. He says this. In verse verse 1c. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. You see, John is now shedding some light on into why the world does not know us or see us as the children of God. Because first, the world did not know Christ. And if it didn't know Christ, how can it know us who have taken on the same characteristics as the Savior? For John chapter 1, verse 11 says this, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And since they did not receive him, Jesus tells us not to be surprised when they treat us the same way. John chapter 15, verse 21, it says this, They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. And here is the thing, that how many times have you been rejected because of you were walking in Jesus' name? Really? That's my problem. 
Because he says that they will reject you. He says, but don't worry about it when they reject you because they rejected me first. But you see, if the world knows you, but they don't know him, do you see the problem? You're known, but he's not. See, if you're walking in him, then you become unknown to the world. Just teaching this morning. Just teaching this morning. You see, and we shouldn't be discouraged when the world shows hate toward us when we stand in him. Jesus says this in John 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Because, see, the earth is not our home. We're only sojourners passing through. We are not what we used to be, a sinner separated from God. But we eagerly look forward to all that we will be in Christ when he returns. Somebody should say something. And it's in verse 2 that John shares what we will be. He says, dear friends, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But, what, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So he's saying, in essence, you're still a work in progress right now. Come on now, right? And so he tells us, we, as we continue to be a work in progress, now in this life, in the coming, with the Lord coming, he says, in this life, we still are in the process of becoming Christ-like. We have to still strive to get to that place. As long as there's breath in your body and life in your veins, this is what you do. For the Apostle Paul shares in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, these words. And we who with unveiled faces, y'all might want to unline that part, with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. See, I'm talking about the real church in the father's love. Do you understand when it says unveiled faces? See, they would put the veil. Remember when Moses, when his, the Shekinah glory was on him? They put a veil in front of him so the people couldn't see it. He's saying we got an unveiled face and God's glory should be seen here. Amen. <sighs> Everywhere you go, in every situation, But you see, then the process will be absolutely complete when we see him as he is. For to see him is to be like him. And then we will be free from the possibility of defilement and sin and sickness and sorrow and death. Paul, y'all know he's my favorite, right? Mm -hmm. Writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, these beautiful yet powerful words who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. But then he writes over in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, these words. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. See, I'm talking about the real church in the Father's love. He's saying the real church, this is what you get. The real church, this is what you have. You see, it's in verse 3, John shares something about the people who have this hope. Buckle your seatbelts up. He says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Oh, my God. That word purify. Mm. It's a beautiful word, and it's an action word, and it's a word that means that you continually work toward emptying out of all of the things that are not like him. Because he's already pure, and our job is to become pure like him in him. 
He's given us what we need to get there in this phase of life to the best of our ability, even though we're yet still wrapped in sinful flesh. But we are also have the challenge of pursuing purifying ourselves. And how do you do it? In his word, keeping his commandments and precepts. And as you walk better and better and closer and closer with him, you start to purify the things out of your life that are not like him. And you start to look more like him. I love this part. Because you see, John clearly states what the life of a child of God should look like. Everyone who has this hope of seeing Christ and being like him must purify himself just as Christ is pure. So as a child of God, there should be a sanctifying influence in the life of a believer. Somebody needs to say something. Sanctifying means that it's been set apart for God's use. Hmm. We don't want to be found doing or even being a part of something that we shouldn't be when Christ returns. That's the funny part. I'm watching these people say and do these things in the name of Jesus, right? With no fear that he might show up today or they might die tonight. You see, again, the underlying theme that runs through the entire New Testament is who is real and who is fake. You had both people claiming the same thing. Only one was true and the other one was not. <clears throat> so let's get out of this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, these words. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. That's the NIV, by the way. Somebody say something. For Jesus is coming back for a church without a spot or a blemish. For the Apostle Paul shares in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, these words, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. Do you get the picture of what kind of church he's looking for? So, there are three things to note when remembering God's love. The first is this. It explains why the world doesn't know us. The world simply does not know or understand what it means to be a child of God. Amen. Amen. And an unbelieving world can only have an uninformed, distorted view of what it means to be in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen. So when you see people out there claiming Christ, but not looking like Christ, they are still the world. Because, see, if you know him, then you cannot represent him that way, calling it like it is. Because see, they don't understand to, to constantly receive grace and mercy and to have someone in whom to place our confident trust in for life and beyond. That's us. That's the real church. Secondly is this. It explains that it's okay to not understand everything written in the word. See, this was one of the lying tricks of the false teachers, the claim to possess secret knowledge, to have answers to questions that often eludes us. See, John is saying knowing that you are a child of God is sufficient enough. Mm, mm, mm. I'm talking about the real church and the father's love. This is what he was teaching. And then thirdly, it explains our motivation to be involved in the process of being like Jesus now. You see, we are the children of God now, not six weeks from now, not when you get two box tops and send them into the, no, now. And since this is true, then how should that affect the way we live and the kind of people we are today? How? How does it affect it? We have to be what he called us to be so that he may be known. You see, someone, I think it was A.W. Tozier, said this. If God loved you as much as 
you love him. No, if God loved you as much as you loved him, where would you be? You see, he, here it is. God loved us enough to make us his children. My question this morning, do you love him enough to make him my father? So as we close, I'm going to share this with you and get out of here. There are a lot of things that will amaze us in this life, but in the end will not be amazing at all. But a mere trick that we don't understand. Here is one thing that can truly amaze the love of God that makes us his children. Truly amaze. Because he knows the depth of how wretched you are as a person, and yet he still loves you enough to save your soul. And he gave his ultimate price for it, his son, to purchase you. And see, and that's what you are today. If you've made the confession of Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you obey his commands. His children. No fluff. Just his children. Mm -hmm. An heir. The king's kid. How beautiful is that? Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word, Master. I pray that all that was shared was acceptable in thy sight, God. I thank you for just how you continue to write on my heart and the energy and the strength and the depth of revelation that you continue to endow me with in this experience, Father. I pray, God, that all that I do honors you and glorifies you, God. And I ask even now, Master, to prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place, but never your sight, Father, that you would continue to go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we should come together again. And Master, we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name, we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. Love you guys. Continue to wash your hands, wear your masks, do your social distancing, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.